Why do research? Because research has the power to, to change lives. So we're all here today because we know about the impact of sight impairment and because we share the common aim that we want to address this. And research provides us with the means to do exactly that. So to address sight impairment, we need to understand how we see and what makes our sight vulnerable to disease. What's required for this? Well, we need to understand health. We need to understand the impact of, of pathology, that's disease, on, on our sight, and the impact that has on our quality of life. And, and there's some, sometimes the specifics of that impact are, are important. So we need to know, we need to discuss what the prior, priorities are in terms of what features of sight loss are most important to us and which we should concentrate on addressing. We are then in a position to design interventions that are intended to um, protect or preserve or even um, reverse impairment of sight. And these interventions range extensively from lifestyle interventions, including diet and exercise, perhaps protection against uh, light, new medicines, whether they're delivered um, as tablets or injections or, or otherwise, and then... Um, new biological treatments that are designed to repair or regenerate diseased tissue, including gene and stem cell therapy that we hear a lot about. And of course, devices, electronic devices, for example, that can um, perhaps make up for some of the, the site that is lost. Well, research can make a difference. Cataract surgery, for example, which we now take for granted, um, but the development, the invention of intraocular lenses um, is a relatively recent um, invention. Um, this is now something which is so routine as to be just generally accepted. But this was something which was developed as a result of research. Surgery for detached retina is another example of something which, until quite recently, was really untreatable. But only through research and the development of new techniques and innovation has it been possible to actually provide a treatment, an intervention, which is remarkably effective in, in the vast majority of instances. So most people can expect to preserve sight despite retinal detachment, which is otherwise a devastating condition. We also are familiar now with injections for wet macular degeneration, and this is now part of many people's lives and has saved the sight of, of millions of people. And all of these treatments are life-changing and the result of research and innovation. So surgery or treatments for degeneration of the retina is now our challenge, and there's no doubt that this is a major challenge. But there is clear progress in this field, this is the result of a number of factors, um, one of which is because of the way that we're doing research. The way we're doing research is changing. It's partly changing because we're benefiting from developments in technology in other fields. And so we're able to harness the power of the new technologies. So, for example, the power of information technology to identify genes that are responsible for disease and to understand the roles of those genes in the disease we are able to use molecular technology to understand the ways that that information in our genes is used. In addition, the new, new, new advances in technology and imaging has generated um, a fantastic opportunity to actually see in the living eye um, the cells and the impact of diseases on cells in the eye, in the living eye of people in, in real time. And, and this is fantastically powerful um, and gives us an idea um, at a level of extraordinary detail about what exactly is going on at the level of the cell. Technologies for gene therapy are advancing and um, there are many advances that, that result in um, more efficient delivery of genes to, um, to the cells in the eye and to do that safely and effectively. And of course stem cell technology is developing all the time and there are many ways that now it's possible to create tissues using stem cells 
for repair and regeneration. Um, and the progress in terms of clinical application of these in clinical trials is, is really very exciting. But in addition to the use of evolving technologies, the way that we are doing research is changing in terms of our partnerships. And this is not just collaborations between academics and universities and hospital clinicians, but also strategic partnerships with funding bodies, including government agencies and charities, as we've already heard from Sue today. But also strategic partnerships with commercial partners, um, including um, industry partners, companies that are, are well established, and companies that we are um, setting up to help to accelerate research in this important area. Most importantly, we're, doing, we're changing the way we do research because we're doing it with the people who are directly affected. And this is, of course, the reason why we're all here today, to discuss the priorities for research and to discuss ways in which we can um, make our research most relevant to the needs of people who are directly affected. Of course, there's already been some work to identify the priorities for research, and the James Lind Alliance is one important aspect. Um, but with having identified these common goals, um, we can share expertise in multidisciplinary collaborations and teams, and share complementary resources in a way that manages, in a way that enables us to to address these concerns most effectively, and enables us to lever additional resource. So we've already heard about the example of the um, genome project from Sue, and this is a really very exciting initiative, um, funded by RP Fighting Blindness and Fight for Sight, and also supported by the NHR. Um, Biomedical Research Centre, the Max Society, and the National Eye Research Centre. And of course, the, the aim of this is to share data to aid the identification of unknown RP genes for research and to promote and facilitate the take-up of genetic testing throughout the NHS. And we've already heard how this has led to advances and rapidly um, identified at least one new gene responsible for RP. So... In terms of recent, recent progress in research, there have been a number of exciting developments. Um, there is progress in um, one particular strategy to make cells in the eye light sensitive when they wouldn't otherwise be light sensitive. Um, there are new gene therapy uh, vectors. This is, these are delivery systems that make it possible to deliver relatively large genes to the cells that require them using um, exciting new techniques. And in terms of clinical application, we've been very encouraged to see from our first clinical trial of gene therapy that people can benefit from gene therapy for as long as three years after a single injection to replace the gene that is otherwise defective. We hope with improvement in the, in the way that this gene is delivered that we can expect even more sustained benefit in the longer term. And there are hopes for an approved treatment, which is um, very soon, which will be really a very major landmark um, in, this, um, in this area. In terms of stem cells, well, there are ongoing trials for stem cells, particularly in approaches in which we are, um, which we are generating retinal pigment epithelial cells. This is the underlying supportive pigmented cells to the light-sensitive photoreceptors. Um, and there are a number of initiatives to do this. Um, a lot of them require teamwork, particularly between commercial and academic ventures as well as hospital partners. So, for example, we've been working at Moorfields with, with a Carter, an American company, to test the safety of stem cells in the eyes of people affected by Stargardt disease. And last, only last week we heard about the first trial of this same approach to test the potential safety and potential benefit of cell transplantation in age-related macular degeneration. Some of these, have, some of these um, developments have actually reached clinical care. So the National Institute for Clinical Excellence has recently reviewed the evidence around um, retinal prosthesis. This is subretinal electronic devices. Um, and the fact that they've even been considered by NICE is a major step forward. In fact, the conclusion is that, to date, 
there is insufficient evidence to support their use as a um, clinical intervention, as, a, as an approved treatment, but certainly there is sufficient evidence to carry on um, investigating and developing these devices in terms of um, clinical trials. But NICE have recently approved a drug which has been developed specifically for um, vitreo macular traction. These are conditions in which the retina is uh, pulled out of position by um, degenerating vitreous gel. So this particular um, new treatment, which is now licensed and funded, it has only been had only reached this, this position as a new treatment because of the many years of research and development. And this is just one example of how research can result in recognised and approved treatments. So, yes, research into retinal disease really has enabled progress. And we'll hear more about this from other speakers. We can expect to meet significant challenges that will make the rate of progress very hard to predict. But by working together, we can be very confident that with commitment and determination, research will make an increasing difference to our lives. Thank you. Lovely. Very nice overview. Thank you very much, Jim. Do we have any questions for Prof Bainbridge? We have one down here. Thank you for that very important question and opportunity for, for clarification. In brief, cells are the building blocks of our tissues, of our tissues and organs. Um, stem, and stem cells are cells which have the potential to generate all sorts of different kinds of cells. So stem cells offer us the opportunity to generate the tissues of the eye and to rebuild the tissues of the eye. In contrast, genes are not building blocks, but the information within each of those cells um, that's required for the cell to develop normally, to function normally and to survive normally. For normal gene function, we require normal genes, um, but genes are inherited, and so defects in the genes can often be inherited. So gene therapy is designed to replace or compensate for, de for defects in the genes, whereas cell therapy is designed to um, regenerate the building blocks of our tissues. Can I ask whether the uh, macular degeneration has got anything to do with heredity? heredity? So the question is whether macular degeneration might be inherited, and that's a very um, interesting question. The suggestion is that there may be aspects of the disease, there may be tendencies to develop the disease which are inherited, but um, Many people, people develop it without affected relatives, and so the, the inheritance is not straightforward, it's not clear, it's not very strong, unlike many inherited conditions that affect younger people. Macular generation is a very common cause of sight impairment as we get older. There can be some inherited predispositions, there can be some tendency for people in the same family to develop the same condition but it's very common for other members of the family not to be affected at all. The question is whether macular degeneration can be treated, and indeed there are forms of the condition um, that can be treated, in particular the wet form of the condition that can be treated with injections. Um, there's a lot of research ongoing to try, uh, try to address the dry form of the condition, which is a commoner form, um, and that's the subject of some of our research and many other research groups worldwide. Do you have any other questions? How long do you think it will be until you can begin to, to look at treating, um, you know, other genes that cause LCA? The question is how long we, it will take before we can treat or do research trials in yeah. other forms of the condition. Yes. So it's always very difficult to predict with confidence how long things are going to take because we don't know what we don't know. Um, but we do have ambitions to treat other forms of LCA within the next few years. That's to say we have ambitions to test 
new treatment approaches within the next few years. Um, there, there are a number of uh, potential challenges, um, not least getting the, the funding for, to do this um, and to um, get all the regulatory permissions um, because it's a really major undertaking, increasingly so, to satisfy all the requirements for a new trial. Um, and there are a number of unpredictable um, questions and answers that we need to address before we can get to the point of starting a trial. But we have every hope of starting more trials um, in our, in our programme um, within the next few years. And I know that there are a number of other research um, programmes that are also intending to address other genes effect causing LCA. There are some uh, conditions that are, are, are very similar to uh, macular degeneration. And I'm just wondering with the, the, the sort of um, uh, stem cell therapy and gene therapy, whether research into macular degeneration would have a spin off for more, uh, should I say, less evident conditions uh, where there may be drusen involved in the eye. Uh, so, you know, do, do you feel that there's any, any mileage in the research that's ta taking place with macular degeneration for, for lesser known conditions? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. There are a number of features that are involved in macular degeneration that are also involved in other conditions, including RP, retinitis pigmentosa, and other degenerations of the retina. So age-related macular degeneration is, is really quite a complicated, complex condition. Um, which is the result of a number of different um, processes, including a genetic predisposition, so some potential genetic faults, um, but also inflammation, um, problems with the circulation, um, and, and age-related loss of cells. And so many of these aspects could be potentially be addressed by um, testing approaches to each, of, each one of those um, in different scenarios. I have got a macular hole in one of my eyes. Can it be treated with stem cell therapy? It's a wonderful lead into our next uh, talk, but uh, it's almost planted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid the answer is at the moment uh, the, the potential for stem cell therapy to help macular holes is, is un untested. Um, so we don't know is the answer. I think that the, certainly the best treatment for macular hole is surgical, it is an operation to close the hole um, before it's got too late. Um, where the macular hole has been there for some time, at the moment there is no treatment to improve the site. Um, but certainly there's a possibility that in the future cell replacement may have a role, it may, it may provide some benefit. I'm afraid it's not going to be in the near future, but it's certainly something that we're interested to find out. Yeah. I had an operation, eye operation, but it did not help me at all for, for the macular hole. That's very disappointing. The, the operation typically improves sight in, in most people. It's not guaranteed, unfortunately, and sometimes people don't benefit. Um, that is disappointing. We are looking at potential ways to address that, and cell replacement therapy is one that, we, that might offer some benefit. It's, it's always very difficult to, to sure. predict how quickly we can expect to um, develop treatments or interventions for, for any condition, mm. uh, not least AMD, which is, which is a complicated and, sure. and challenging target. Yeah. Um, I think we can be confident that we will make incremental um, progress in the development of treatments, but it's going to be, it's, it's going to be some time sure. before we're going to be able to... to make mass a massive difference. So my sister's in her 40s, perhaps in her lifetime, possibly? I'm very confident that in her lifetime there will be new treatments available. Yeah. Thank you. Completely agree. It's definitely realistic optimism. Um, there, are, there are pharmacological approaches, oral approaches, intravitreal approaches, stem cell approaches. So it's, it's very broad um, research portfolio. So we can be optimistic.